Um, a very, very good afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another webinar in this series that um, started a few weeks ago and that are intended to clarify and elucidate uh, different aspects of the activities of the uh, task force um, formed by the government to look into all the aspects um, of, um, of mental health in this country. Um, we have already looked at a, a number of chapters in, in, this, in this, our report, and I am happy to report that um, a great deal of interest um, has emerged from the discussions that we have had. Um, and um, today we will be looking at uh, chapter five um, of the report, that is for those who have already had a look at the report. And this is the chapter that deals with uh, special groups uh, and or people with uh, special um, mental health needs. Um, with us this afternoon uh, are two distinguished uh, members of the, of the panel. Um, and I'd like to say this from the outset, that contrary to uh, popular belief and perhaps expectation, um, our task force um, consisted of men and women from very varied uh, backgrounds as you will see <clears throat> this afternoon. Our very own uh, Joyce Nato um, is a psychiatrist and for the time being is uh, working for the World Health uh, Organization. I don't know if it's true to say that helping them better understand um, the mental health needs and other aspects of non-communicable diseases uh, in our region. Uh, so um, as far as the uh, task force composition goes, uh, Joyce Nato brought in a very important um, component and experience, which is in fact global, because as you all know, the World Health Organization is a global body. So uh, globally, um, we are represented uh, by Joyce Nato. On the other hand, <clears throat> we have an equally distinguished uh, member of the task force, um, Mr. Raymond Ching, um, who works uh, for, the, for, for the government. Um, Mr. Ching has a special uh, interest um, in the youth. And in fact, therefore, it is not a surprise that Bona Ching works for the Ministry of Youth um, ICT and Innovation as the principal uh, secretary. And he will this afternoon uh, be talking to us um, about young men and women um, who, uh, who constitute uh, a very large part of our country. So uh, without further ado, um, let me explain the, the rules of the house. Um, the house rules require that um, the first presenter will be Dr. Neto, who will have exactly uh, 15 minutes uh, to do her presentation. Um, I will then ask uh, Priscilla, uh, Dr. Macau, uh, together with one or two of our colleagues, um, to put questions or challenges uh, to Dr. Neto for about 10 minutes. Uh, that we will discuss her presentation. And then after that, I will ask Raymond Ching to do his presentation and we will receive uh, questions and comments on his presentation. Uh, and then at four o'clock, uh, all being equal, I will say it is now four o'clock. and That will bring us to the end uh, of the afternoon unless I receive instructions to the contrary. Uh, from the organizers of this webinar. Joyce Nato, you have the floor. Speak to the people of this country uh, about this task force report and your participation therein. 
Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I'm happy that I'm going to do a presentation. And uh, as you have been told, we are going to talk about mental health and special populations. Why do we take out the special populations? Please go to the next slide. Yeah, mental health. When we mention mental health, we say that mental health is not equal to mental illness. We all require good mental health status. And mental health is a state of well-being in which you realize your abilities, you can cope with the normal stresses of life, you can work productively and fruitfully and contribute positively to your community. So we all require good mental health status. Mental health is important at every stage of life, from childhood, adolescent, throughout to adulthood. And by the way, even children in utero require good mental health status. Mental illness is not a personal failure. If one has a mental illness, that's not a personal failure. In fact, if there is failure, it is found in how we respond to people with mental and brain disorders. We contribute a lot. Next. Now, why mental health and special populations? Who are the special uh, populations? These are the groups of people whose mental, it, whose mental health needs require special consideration and attention. We all require good mental health status, but the mental health needs of these populations re, uh, require special considerations. They can be defined by age, by occupation, biological, psychological, or social characteristics. Mental illnesses are not easily identified in these special groups. And the burden of mental illness shown in these uh, special groups is usually higher. It has been shown that they have higher uh, the prevalence of mental illness. So we really need have to give a good focus on these uh, vulnerable groups. There are very many of them, but uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the ones that concern women and children and the occupational risks. We know that uh, uh, globally 10% of pregnant women have a mental illness and 13% of new mothers will also display signs of a mental illness. It is good if, we, if women become pregnant, we really become happy and so on, but know that 10% of those pregnant women will have a mental illness and primarily is mainly depression. They may have any other, but depression is very, very high. And if we look at the developing countries, these figures are actually higher. 16% of pregnant women develop a mental illness, while 20% of nursing mothers will develop a mental illness. High risk is usually due to poverty, migration, extreme stressors, exposure to violence, emergency and conflict situations, natural disasters, and low, so, uh, and low social support. A mental illness in a pregnant woman or in a nursing mother will lead to self and family neglect. They will neglect themselves and eventually neglect the family. They'll neglect the children. And at the end of the day, find that it negatively affects the, the child's growth and the development. If not treated, this mental illness can actually be very severe and may lead to death by suicide. So it's very important that early identification is very, very important and prompt treatment will lead to normal life. Next. We 
we have seen that about 10% of pregnant women will develop a mental illness. It is also shown that at the global level, 10 to 20% of children have a mental condition. That is very high. Children, like in the developing one, children are normally more, there are many and so on. And if 10 to 20% of them have a mental condition, how do we uh, focus on these children? And it's been shown that half of mental disorders, all disorders, half of mental disorders begin before the age of 14. So it means it may have even started earlier age seven, age eight, and so on. So it's very important that we focus on this. Mental health conditions are displayed differently in children. That's why it's a special group. They display the signs and symptoms very differently. So we really need to be very observant. For example, they are very irritable. They have uh, sleep disturbances. They cry unnecessarily. If a parent is, or a parent or a guardian is leaving, they have what we call separation anxiety. They may have weight loss. And sometimes they display physical illness. For example, if a child is afraid of going to school, every morning, school day, you find the child has diarrhea, the child is vomiting, and so on. So you wonder if the child has malaria or what. But at the end of the day, it's just because the child has phobia for school. The children can develop anxiety, they can develop mood disorders like depression and so on. They also have what we call eating disorders where they can't control themselves. There is this also common condition that we call autism spectrum disorder that is very, very uh, common in children. And it affects the developmental aspects of the child. The developmental aspects and also ability to communicate and interact with people. The child will have a, a problem in that. Uh, there is also another condition known as uh, attention deficit hyper, hyperactivity disorder, whereby the child displays a uh, the child will, will have to display the difficulties in paying attention. They may be hyperactive and they may have impulsive uh, behavior. This condition is very difficult to distinguish from normal childhood this, uh, uh, behaviors because we know that children, I mean, many times they may not pay attention to what you are saying. They may be active because we always say that a, a good a, a good child should be active. And with that, if a child becomes not active, then you know that maybe the child is unwell. But if we have this child who is hyperactive, is, is, is not paying attention well, and quite impulsive, we, it, it is good for parents to look at it and know, is this child okay? Or is, is, is it the normal uh, behavior or, uh, or is it above normal? Children with mental disorders face major challenges like stigma, isolation, and discrimination. Isolation in the manner that the community plays a lot on this because as a mother, I have this child with a mental illness, but the society is looking at me as that woman who gave birth to a child with a mental illness. So I decide to isolate my child, hide the child in the house and so on, and that is not good. So the society has to come out and embrace and see how we can support these children. Uh, of course, isolation and the the discrimination also occurs in the schools, in the communities, and so on. Uh, if untreated, mental disorders will severely impact on a child's uh, development, their educational uh, attainments, and their potential life fulfilling and uh, and uh, and uh, and a productive life. So. We really have to be observant and 
if we notice that the child has a mental disorder, it's important that we treat the child as early as possible. Next. Uh, there is a lot to talk about uh, maternal mental health and child mental health, but time is not on our side, and a lot is in the document. So please, we are just looking at the synopsis so that at the end of the day, you go in the document and see. I'm also going to look at mental health and occupational re uh, risks. Particularly, I'm focusing on prisons. At prisons, there is high level, there's high prevalence of mental disorders in these uh, setups. And the reasons are so varied, there are many and so on, one being congestion, they are really congested. Of course, the prison is supposed to correct somebody, no comfort there and so on, but at the end of the day, you find that there is a lot of discomfort at the prison se settings. And then the cases are not uh, 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 processed as early as possible. So you find that somebody stays there for a very long time the, because of the criminal justice uh, process. So it's important that uh, we look at uh, mental health status at the prison level. There is also ina inadequate mental health services at uh, the prison settings. You could find maybe one healthcare provider that is giving services to a thousand, two thousand people and so on. That may not be sufficient. And on top of that, because of the overcrowding, a lot of space at the, at the facility, you find that the carers are also affected. They may be affected because of the space that they are undergoing. These pain forces also showed that they have problems. And this we got from the people themselves talking to us. We visited the prison area. We got uh, uh, submissions from the displaced forces. And one of the things that really came out was that we, the displaced forces, are so physically prepared, but we are never emotionally prepared. Looking, for example, at, at the police service, they are physically prepared, but when there is an accident, for example, who should arrive there first is the police officer, and you find somebody is crashed inside that vehicle and so on, and it's the work of the police officer to remove this body and take wherever it, they are supposed to take. The trauma they undergo is really, really a lot. So it's very, very important that we also prepare these officers emotionally. Often encountering traumatic instances, as I mentioned, and because of these traumatic instances that they encounter, it leads to increased uh, the prevalence of post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, such as they get depression, they may have panic attacks, they may have phobia, fear of uh, the following day, they don't know what they'll encounter the following day, they may get, they may get uh, mania, or they may go into substance abuse, trying to forget, trying to use substance abuse to forget what they saw, and this is just aggravating the situation. And at the end of the day, they may even be suicidal. They really experience extreme violence. For example, the armed forces, they experience severe uh, violence, and they endure the possibility of their own life being taken away dying any moment and so on. So all this affects their mental status. Another issue that came out was like, they, they have long stay away from their families and friends because of duty. And this really affects them. And uh, mentally, we need to support them. Next. Now, after listening to the people and going around, the task force made the following uh, recommendations. Some of, the recommend, some of the recommendations that were made, most of them are in the 
and in the in the document i could not put them here because of time number one is integrate mental health services with antenatal care and postnatal care at all levels of health care starting from community level going up to level six we have to have to integrate mental health services with antenatal care and postnatal care catering for mothers nursing mothers and for the children we have to create awareness to parents guardians uh, that are taking care of children on mental health uh, needs of the children as you have noted children may express mental illness the symptoms of mental illness very differently from adults so if the parents are made aware to look for these signs and symptoms we shall be able to manage the children in uh, uh, as early as possible and earlier management usually leads to even cure we have to increase mental health care prov uh, the providers at correctional facilities we have to increase because there are few and when they are there they can be able to initiate services like screen and provide timely management of mental health conditions to inmates there, there will be no delay of saying that they sent this person to such a facility and so on so they manage the inmates very well we need to to streamline the judicial process to expeditiously dispose of cases in order to decongest the system to reduce stress because congestion alone on its own will lead to stress avail mental health services to discipline forces and provide regular debriefing on mental health at all workplaces including at the displaced forces places whereby both the managers and the staff are, are uh, debriefed on mental health and the needs of good mental health uh, status Next. in conclusion let me say that anyone can be affected by a mental illness anyone However, the prevalence has been shown to be higher in vulnerable groups. We need mainstream mental health services in all sectors, not all health services, but in all sectors, because everyone requires good mental health status. Persons living with mental health conditions can succeed in life if we positively and promptly address mental conditions. We have to create parental and community awareness on good mental health status, mental wellness, mental illness, mental conditions, signs and symptoms. Let's create this awareness. Regular debriefing to staff and managers at workplaces on mental health is important and will enable us to have good mental health status. If a country has persons with good mental health status, it will be a wealthy nation because we always say that eh, there is no health without mental health and there is no wealth without health. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you so, 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 so much, Dr. Tari. It's an excellent um, presentation of a very interesting subject. Uh, <laughs> I've seen a question from somebody called Monica Kinanjui that says that uh, in your presentation, you didn't speak about me, uh, that is the elderly. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I think that's probably all right because if Monica looks at um, the same chapter four, uh, ITM 4.5, it actually talks about senior citizens um, who are over the age of 60 um, and so on and so forth. I think what uh, you didn't have time to do, uh, Dr. Clary, is to go through the whole chapter, which is something that we will be uh, asking um, Raymond to do uh, when he talks about the youth and other. 
But I think there were quite a number of take for home messages, uh, the, the Dr. Neto, that require re emphasizing um, that figure of 20% for, for women um, who have um, delivered babies who are said to have um, mental illnesses. It's a very large number. And I think your suggestion, our suggestion, shall I say, of integrating antenatal care uh, with mental health services, or, or the other way around, mental health services into, is a very important and, and a critical one. Uh, perhaps um, Raymond will be talking about the fact that mental illnesses start, 50% of them start before the age of 14. That, I think, is a very big uh, take home uh, for all of us. Um, another take home, I think, um, in this respect, was the fact that um, disciplined officers are very strong uh, in their bodies because they do exercise every day and, um, and they, they become very strong. That their emotional strength, um, as we discovered, is suspect. Um, and really one of the key recommendations there is that disciplined forces need to have strength, both physical and mental, because of the extreme stresses that we as a country place on those ones. Those for me were the key take home messages. Uh, Priscilla and team, do you have a question for Dr. Neto? Yeah. Now they have gone. Where are they gone? All right. Hello. Uh, Hi, so I don't have a question for Dr. Nato. So maybe okay. we can continue and then we can do other questions at the end. Thank you. I will, I, I will ask Dr. Njuguna because he's had uh, the presentation to make any comment because he's a panelist um, as a director of mental health. I mean, his opinions have to be taken always very, very seriously. Dr. Njuguna, any comment on uh, Dr. Nato's presentation? Yeah, so thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Nato. I think that was uh, quite good. I think the take-home message is uh, we need to put a lot of effort to look out for issues about mental well-being among the children, so parenting and awareness among the parents to be able to address these issues, and not, not, not only the parents, also the teachers. So the issues of school mental health become very important. So we integrate mental health in the maternal and child health services, but also in school. So thank you. Back to chair. Thank you very much. So we must now uh, proceed. Um, I have seen uh, on the chat a number of questions from um, um, people asking uh, about integration and the implementation of the task force uh, recommendations. Dr. Njuguna, I think it, uh, I will ask you towards of the end of this afternoon um, to give uh, the people, and there are really very many people participating so far, uh, some idea of the steps that will be taken um, by way of implementing the recommendations um, of this report, uh, bearing in mind that they can't all be implemented on the same day, and the fact that it has to be phased um, and taking account of uh, the administrative legislative um, re recommendations that we have made. So I'll be asking you towards the end of the presentation to do that. In the meantime, so, um, it's okay. uh, yeah, thank you, Doc. I, I'm sure you'll be well prepared for that. In the meantime, I now welcome a good friend, uh, Raymond Cheng, um, to proceed with his uh, presentation. Raymond, over to you. Thank you so much, Chair, and uh, our colleagues of, within the task force, uh, members, and, uh, and all the general public who are watching us live, uh, <clears throat> young people, uh, also known as Mabijana. Uh, we are very glad to be uh, part of this today. <clears throat> and uh, first of all, Chair, I must thank you. I must thank uh, Ministry of Health in terms of uh, the special consideration that was given to um, these special populations and especially uh, when I'm talking about uh, the youth of this country who uh, from 0 to 35 years of age uh, just in the concluded 2019 Kenya National Bureau of Statistics um, uh, data in terms of survey, uh, population survey, uh, gave 75% of the population 
and uh, chair <clears throat> as we speak as my uh, powerpoint uh, presentation is being projected as we speak uh, we have um, we have the covid uh, pandemic which again just confirms uh, who are the majority who are affected and we get to find that uh, young people are 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 uh, hugely affected because of their numbers and that also um, uh, gives us the joy and the comfort that um, the government and through the president's directive had to also uh, make this uh, special group uh, to be heard. Uh, some cannot speak to, for themselves, some can articulately uh, speak for themselves, but all said and done, uh, they were given a chance. And uh, part of uh, what we found out were not what we sat down uh, somewhere uh, as experts and just penned them down. We listened to young people. Why I'm saying this, uh, um, uh, members and, 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 and all the uh, people are listening, is that one of the critical things about youth is uh, the, the sense that they must be had, the sense that they must be part of uh, the preparation. They always have a quote, they say that, um, young people say that if they are not, if you're not on the table, you can either be on the table as the menu or you're the one who is, uh, um, who is taking the menu. So they always want to be part of, of, of the table, not as the menu, but as the people who are uh, part of uh, the meal. Uh, so the, uh, you can go to my first slide. Yeah, so when we talk about uh, mental health and special population, uh, special population are, uh, have needs that require a lot of concentration and attention. And this means that when you have uh, so much need and with the limited resources, you'll always find that all these needs cannot be addressed. And uh, this population is defined by age, occupation, biological, uh, sociological characteristics, and this is uh, within the MOH uh, 2017. So mental illness in this group is not easily identified, as the burden of mental conditions could even be higher than that of the general public. And we've always seen in terms of um, when young people have got a higher burden of, uh, of mental conditions, uh, they resort to many things. They resort to drugs and substance abuse, uh, some resort to betting, uh, most of them uh, resort to um, alcoholism in terms of drinking and sometimes drinking uh, those uh, very hazardous uh, kind of drinks that uh, just messes up their lives and, and you get to get to uh, see some of the uh, vices that young people are going through. So this group includes children, <clears throat> adolescents, the youth, the senior citizens, the gender-based uh, violence survivors, the LGBT, the boy child and the refugees, the uh, refugees amongst others. So all these fall within uh, the special uh, population. Uh, next slide. And uh, you can see in that picture, in terms of young people are lovers of life. They, they have got uh, high ambitions. They've got, um, they are Americans. Some of, some of them, they are Americans and Europeans uh, living, living in normal neighborhoods. So it means high expectations of life, uh, then means that if that is not the results and the trajectory that their lives goes through, then you find uh, they begin to have uh, those challenges. They begin to have those negative uh, signals in terms of their health. And this now uh, comes to a mental illness. So in terms of committing suicide, uh, not committing suicide, I mean, sorry, dying by suicide, uh, these are some of the things that I learned in, being in this task force in terms of the human rights-based approach in terms of looking at mental health. They die by suicide. And that is who young people are. Indeed, energy, they're tech savvy. So at the end of the day, how do we address them? Next slide. So the adolescents and mental health, uh, this is a transition period between 12 and 18 years. And why is it very critical? Uh, it's very critical because it's a crucial uh, period for developing and maintaining social, emotional habits that are important for mental well-being. If anybody has ever uh, related to the people who are so-called teenagers, the court called teenagers, they're very difficult to deal with. Even parents have a challenge with dealing with uh, teenagers. Everybody, a sister or a brother to a teenager, does not understand what a teenagers really go through because sometimes they tend to isolate themselves. So this is a point where emotional habits are being driven. These habits include the healthy sleeping patterns that are very critical, exercising, developing of problem mechanism, interpersonal skills, and managing emotion. So it means at this critical stage of adolescence, if it is not, if they are not handled very well, and social support and uh, structure of the society does not address their plight very well, then we find uh, they form 
uh, they become victims. So it is estimated that 10 to 20% of adolescents globally experience mental health conditions, yet they remain undiagonized and undertreated. And this is according to the World Health Organization report of 2014. So again, as you can see in terms of statistics, globally, and you'll find even in terms of some other societies that uh, some of the basic needs and healthcare systems are not so much developed, then we are guaranteed that in terms of uh, Kenya and other African countries, we even shoot higher and double uh, of, 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 of that percentage given. So the task force recommends psychological services should be made available and teachers' capacity should be enhanced uh, to address uh, this particular uh, cohort. Uh, next slide. And again, uh, that just shows the numbers, the numbers uh, within these uh, special populations. And that's why they, be, they end up being under-treated uh, because the resources are few, yet they're the uh, common majority. Uh, next slide. So the youth and mental health. <clears throat> and as I said before, uh, the uh, census of 2019 uh, pointed to the numbers of the young people. So these are transition from childhood and, and dependence to adulthood independence. Uh, so UN entities, instruments, and uh, regional organizations have somewhat a different definition of youth. According to our Kenyan constitution 2010, we define young uh, people from ages 18 <clears throat> to 34 years of age, uh, uh, 11 months, and uh, 29, uh, 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 29 days, you know, when you clock, uh, 35 exactly, then you are no longer the youth. So the poverty, gender inequality, inequity, and human rights violations have shown uh, to increase incidences of mental health. Decreased ability to make rational choices has led to mental health conditions. Youth have lamented about joblessness, need to be involved in policy making and implementation. <clears throat> and I want to just bring this to the participants that uh, uh, this report is one of the most uh, honest uh, reports that I would ever find that has spoken to government and duty bearers in terms of the plights of the young people. Because chair, when, 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 when you read, uh, when you go to the annex chair of this document, you'll find that uh, in page number 90 of this document, we're talking about, we caution against dealing with symptoms. And when we were talking about the uh, young people, the, the, the deliberateness of this document and this work that just said that, you know, when we are talking about young people, let's not look at the symptoms. And I think this would really hurt very many young people because when you're talking about um, many of us needs to be treated for mental health, the question is, why are we landing, why are we having uh, mental illnesses? It's because of the hopelessness that young people have had. And that's when we had uh, a young person gave us a very moving story chair and uh, that story will be my closing. But at the end of the day, the socioeconomics, the economics around it then uh, challenges these young people. So the task force supports youth empowerment by implementations and recommendations by the uh, relevant government agencies. So we, the, the task force report was, uh, was very critical in terms of uh, saying that the government agencies must have uh, their youth empowerment uh, uh, programs that are impactful, that would change uh, and transform the lives of the young people. Because if we don't do that, then we end up dealing with what we said in page number 90, is we are dealing with the symptoms and not the real root causes. Next slide. Uh, the refugees and mental health. Refugees experience is divided into uh, following stages. And, uh, and this was also a little bit very mind opening. Till uh, when you feel you're not part of this population, then you get to know that pre-flight stage is a, is a challenge because many young people lose their families, livelihoods and belongings. We have the flight stage whereby this involves uncertain journey from home to an area that you do not know, separation from families. Uh, you have the resettlement stage whereby this uh, affects uh, your culture because you settle in a community that does not speak your language. So refugees suffer more from depression and anxiety disorder. Uh, so the task force recommends, amongst others, that the government and other bodies to provide a supportive environment and basic needs that can be accessed uh, by these refugees. In terms of the human-based uh, rights approach that they need to access, they have the rights to access the basics so that then we help them. So they're not just people who are happy, who are put in a compound somewhere to be held, uh, to be uh, served later, but they're going through all those challenges. Next slide. 
uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, LGBT uh, population. And again, when you talk about uh, LGBT, I, I know it is a very, very, very controversial area. It is an area that uh, many people would feel that then if they're going through a mental illness, then they should be as a result of uh, them being punished uh, for being discordant to what the community is. If, if, if you know somebody like this, then they become isolated. But at the end of the day, this group has unique health needs because every person who's got a challenge of mental illness has the right to be attended to, regardless of every opinion that we may have. But at the end of the day, they also go through mental uh, health problems. So these individuals are persecuted, they are vilified, they are violently uh, assaulted, this is mainly because of their sexual orientation, uh, gender identity, and also our cultural uh, bias and in terms of even our conservative nature as an African culture. So at the end of the day, violence causes enormous suffering that often unmasks a veil of silence and isolation leading to mental distress. So at the end of the day, uh, these people can be your brother, they can be your sister, they can be your own son and your own daughter. And I believe we may not um, be in a position uh, to outrightly feel that then they need to be isolated and suffer without being attended to. So the task force recommends that a mental health service be made accessible to them. Health workers need to be trained to offer non-discriminatory uh, care and services, psychological support services should be provided to them without discrimination. And, 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 and even the stigmatization that we had, that you ask yourself, uh, look at that picture. Are you, it's like when you, when you try to imagine that you are having mental illness, then uh, umechizi, and at the end of the day, ukichizi, if you hear our chair person is going, is accessing a mental health um, um, uh, services, then unusema umechizi. So uh, even the stigmatization that goes through, then makes everybody should walk into every hospital, every young person should walk uh, to, uh, to a, a hospital with and, and be treated with the dignity. And I believe that was what informed us to have a very powerful mantra that towards happiness and national prosperity. You cannot have that if people are discriminated. We cannot have that if the basic needs cannot be accessed to all. So that's something that boldly came from this report. Boy child, young boys have been left out in many programs after the advent of female liberation movement. Uh, many have low self-esteem and have lost their confidence and drive their necessary uh, for success. And this one you've seen even in terms of what boy, uh, boy, uh, boy child are doing. Some of them are committing suicide. Some of them are stabbing and killing their girlfriends simply because they have self-esteem issues. So the uh, task force recommends government to take affirmative action initiatives, regularly review what needs to be undertaken for this group, enforce the laws that aim at protecting the children, uh, strengthening guidance and counseling and teaching of life skills in schools. And we came out very clearly to look at schools so that you don't have a teacher who is the same teacher again who is doing uh, guidance and counseling because then it means if I access that teacher, I'll be marked like I'm a problem and already I'll already be isolated and the stigma will be on me. Uh, next slide. So gender-based violence survivors and mental health, so GBV survivors have a lot of secrecy about their experiences, which leads to depression. Uh, violence has been identified as a leading cause of injury and harm. And even during this uh, uh, COVID pandemic, even the president pronounced himself on this in terms of what is happening because of depression. So the task force recommends that mental health case, uh, care services should be uh, easily accessible, again, to the GBV survivors without discrimination and as a basis of everybody has got access to uh, the basic health uh, system. Uh, we have the next slide. So the next slide is uh, uh, just opening up again for uh, uh, Q&D questions and discussions to just um, relook at what uh, the special populations were all about. And what came out very strongly is that empowerment strategies for government were highlighted to be very critical so that we don't, uh, uh, we don't address, uh, we, we address the root causes and not the symptoms. And Chair, I finish with um, what we heard from a young person who came to KICC and told us that when he was young, he worked so hard and he performed so well and he was on the newspaper for being the best student in his place. And again, 
after finishing university, again, he was on the newspaper that government had to blacklist him because he had not paid his help. So that tells you opportunities to young people is everything that would help uh, this special population. Chair, with those remarks, I submit. Thank you so, 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 my mother was very, very quick and succinct. Um, those who will have read the report, uh, will appreciate your comments a great deal. And those who have not, uh, will be encouraged to, to, to look at this particular chapter. Priscilla, you have some questions for the panelists. You're muted, Priscilla. We can't hear what you're saying, and I'm sure you're saying some good things. We still can't hear you. No. Um, yeah, almost hearing you now. Yeah, no. are you hearing okay. me now? Yeah, very loud and clearly. Go on. Good. So we can start with Dr. Nato. Go on. And uh, there was something for what action uh, can be taken for suicide, homicide, violence in the cells or in the different forces that we have even for the youth and children, what action can be taken for the people who uh, seem to die by suicide? And um, they're also just saying we should normalize therapy among the forces so that we can reduce the stigma. So make it like a routine. But the main question is what action can be taken? Uh, Joyce? You're muted, Joyce. Yes, I was just unmuting myself. Oh, thank you very much. Now, persons who die by suicide or homicide in cells, that is a symptom, a symptom to the government that there is a stress, there is a problem, there is a mental health problem in the society, and that Kenyans are not healthy. That is why we came up with the document. Uh, inside the document, chapter one, I think, talks of mental wellness. And, and in the document, one of the recommendations is a happiness index. The country to be carrying out annual happiness index. Now, all this shows that where are we as a country in terms of mental wellness. So whatever that should be done is uh, to make sure, to see to it that Kenyans have mental wellness. They have good mental health status so that at the end of the day, suicide is not off. So I'm just trying to say that suicide is a symptom of mental illness in the society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Priscilla. Yes, and then we have many questions for the youth. So, uh, directed to Raymond, um, we can start with what about how do you identify mental illnesses uh, in a large population, like in a university? How would you go about knowing that? And uh, they're asking how you came up with a cut cut off of 35 years as people under 35 are categorized as the youth, given that even those above 35 will still. Um, go through similar economic and social cultural context. So we had such questions. Raymond? Uh, th th thank you very, uh, uh, Chair. In terms of um, ages uh, uh, 18 to 35, we have uh, nothing much to do about it because it's uh, within our constitutional, um, it's, it's in the constitution. So. And unless uh, we amend the constitution, though I know in terms of Africa, if you analyze at what point should somebody settle in life after finishing university, doing their job search and everything, you'll find by around 38, uh, 39, and that's why our politicians at age 50 are called youth. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, UN also is a little bit um, uh, different because when you talk with the uh, UN and development partners on youth work and youth interventions, they talk about uh, youth to be between ages 16 to 24. So above 24, you are not uh, youth. So the African Charter and the Kenyan Constitution pegs a young people at um, 35. But again, that one does not restrict uh, anybody. And I believe in terms of uh, our task force report did not 
uh, actually, if you read between it, it is clear what is mainstream through the whole document is non-discrimination. So there's nothing that you will be discriminated around mental health simply because you've passed age 35. So that should give uh, that participant uh, colleague um, so much comfort. And then uh, the other idea about uh, the university, and we went even deeper in terms of conversing this matter, even to high schools, because you see, even at university level, uh, comrades are a little bit very, very, very strong in airing their voices. They are very strong through their student movements. And when you address even these issues, even at, at high schools, whereby uh, it's a little bit a small command center whereby you don't have your rights, uh, teachers um, are a little bit authoritative and they make all those decisions. Uh, if we could address it at that point to ensure that we have structures of addressing uh, mental health at institutional levels and even having experts who are not necessarily uh, lecturers and who are not necessarily teachers because uh, Chair, if you can remember and, and all the members, some of the biases that we had even within high school that we always believe that a teacher who is in charge of CU becomes uh, the counselor and becomes the person that addresses mental health. She could be your uh, mathematics teacher or she could be teaching, taking you through geography. So when on one other end she's taking me through geography, then in the evening I go that I have mental illness, already I've been blacklisted, already the stigma is there. That when I come to class, I don't perform, it could be because I'm a problem because I came to see her. So at the institutional levels, we propose clear structures and well, um, well capacity built professionals to handle mental health and not just picking people because they are spiritual, they are good looking, they are calm, but that was not the essence of the task force. So I believe this would also be in a long way in terms of just bringing the university leadership in terms of rolling out uh, this mental health uh, 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 report that will be adopted across all institutions. So people within the universities be at rest that uh, where if it is implemented, non-discriminatory, and it will address your needs. Thanks so much, Chair. Thank you Just so, so, so much. Yeah, why, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, we still need to, have to hear Dr. Njuguna, but go on, go on, go on, Dr. He, he, he talked about <laughs> uh, education, and so there was something about um, wh what can we do about uh, mental health and education. Are we able to put it in the curriculum? Is that something that came out in the report? Yes, uh, Dr. Priscilla, uh, that came out in the report in terms of uh, uh, mainstreaming mental health in the curriculum, even at the earliest uh, stage of life, so that then when somebody is having a uh, mental illness or mental health, it, uh, so <laughs> that is the word. You, you, you just have any challenge like any other person. So it was part of the curriculum as part of the recommendations. All right, um, I, I think um, I will take the discretion of chair to uh, urge that uh, we now listen to Dr. Njuguna um, and, and we'll also exercise some discretion in allowing us to go on past four o'clock. So we'll continue taking questions after Dr. Njuguna and we will remain online for an additional 10 minutes up to 10 past four. Dr. Njuguna? Director of Mental Health, Republic of Kenya. Uh, so, Dr. Njuguna is not, uh, something happened to the internet, so maybe you can check more questions as he tries to rejoin. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> before you ask the next question, which is perfectly in order, I, we have no problem with that. Um, I'd like to thank one or two people. Esther, uh, Dr. Esther Nyabuti is the one who wanted to know something about mental illness in, in large groups. Welcome to our webinar from all the way from Eldoret. We've had um, a, a few questions on um, um, about um, TSC and the children. Uh, Caroline Okanda is asking about um, the fact that mental illnesses occur, 50% occur before the age of uh, 14 years. This is brilliant. I think this is very, very good that this question is being asked. Um, part of the reason of um, doing, um, of writing this kind of report is to increase uh, information and knowledge amongst the people of Kenya so that as we demand, which is our right, that uh, government, uh, TSC and other places react uh, uh, properly 
to our to our request. This is done from a position of strength uh, by people who have read um, the report. So really, um, as chair, I'm very encouraged by the, um, the the extent of the interest that is self-evident, even by the numbers of people who are here with us uh, this afternoon. Priscilla, uh, I think we'll give a question to as you wait for Dr. Tribuna to just Raymond. I think uh, Raymond covered a lot. So there's something about the LGBTQ. The question is, what is the most immediate action? And since we are the ones championing for mental health uh, rights in the country, is it possible to be the ones to champion this cause? Thank Before you. Raymond answers that question, I think the premise um, of, um, of this afternoon's presentation is the, and Raymond, you'll still answer, eh? uh, is the recognition that all Kenyans are equal before the law. Um, and um, that means that any person who is within the territory of the Re Re Republic of Kenya is entitled to the full enjoyment um, of all the rights that are bestowed upon them by our constitution. And that is why when we look at uh, the groups whether we are looking at uh, refugees, whether we are looking at uh, uh, disciplined forces, whether we're looking at the boy child, whether you're looking at uh, survivors of gender-based violence, these are special groups of Kenyans um, who must be given the rights and the privileges that are enshrined upon them uh, by the constitution. Now, Raymond, you must now answer the other question. Uh, thank you, Chair. This was uh, worrying me like a heavy train, but I believe you've really, <laughs> you've really lifted the burden off. And as the way Chair has pointed out, uh, uh, it's not about uh, championing for and pushing for LGBT rights per se in terms of its general totalities. But the way Chair said, uh, this is matter, matter, uh, a matter to do with the health. And the basic, um, yeah, the basic principle here is everybody has got a right uh, to get um, um, attended to uh, as far as a mental health is concerned, regardless of your affiliation. Because we believe, even when you talk about Christian Muslim, it's already a division in terms of um, some extreme Christians believe this is our belief. Extreme Muslims believe this. Extreme Buddhists believe this. So it's not, it was not about to come to a special population in terms of their beliefs and push their beliefs, but it's about everybody has got a right to health and everyone has got a right to mental health. So I think that's what we are standing for. The rest, we leave for the other actors to push within uh, their own rights. So the, that's the principle uh, that we, 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 we are advocating for. And a part of what we'll also address this is um, the sensitization and awareness of, of, of mental health uh, as part of a recommendation that came out. And this one comes to one person with help and not any other persuasion. So thanks so much, Chair, for also bringing uh, that dimension. Very no, 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 I mean, seriously, there's, um, Raymond, there's, um, there's another question that I've seen um, in the chat from a person called Kamul, um, which again goes back to the elderly. I'm so happy to hear people are interested in the elderly. We are very, very few. I think we are constitute only 2.5% of the population. Uh, but nonetheless, I think we are very important. The question that is being asked um, is in relation to um, this COVID-19 maneno um, and the, the fact that um, every time any expert stands up, um, they say, oh, you was there, oh, you the elderly, then get out, oh, stay in your bedroom, under the bed. Uh, so this, <laughs> this person is actually asking a question, perhaps I should ask Joyce. Is this not likely to drive the elderly into deeper depression? Because you young people keep telling us that you, oh, you know, you're going to fall very sick like that. Just you, you, you're a mental health expert. You know, comment on that. <laughs> It's a special group. The elderly are a special group, which is what this chapter is, is considering today. Please make a comment. Thank you, Chair. Indeed, they are a special group. And uh, to the elderly, I think they should know that there is no discrimination. In terms of COVID-19, what has been seen is that 
COVID-19 is severe in persons with other health conditions. And there are higher chances that the elderly have with other health conditions. For example, high blood pressure, or they may have arthritis, they may have, you know, whatever. And if you have any other health condition, it means your immunity has gone down. So uh, maybe it is the way we have sent out the information that hides the elderly, but the information should be clear saying that uh, we are protecting the elderly because their immunity is fairly lower as compared to the, these other uh, age groups. And the reason why they should be taken care of uh, they should not get COVID-19 because if they get COVID-19, it tends to be severe. And we don't want to lose our elderly because where shall we get our wisdom from? So it's, it's just to take care of you, not that to be discriminated. So uh, the other common is that uh, we love the elderly so, so, so much. We have to keep reminding them to stay safe. Priscilla, stop laughing and ask the next question, please. Okay. <laughs> yes, we love the elderly. Yeah. So <laughs> that's, that's what is being said, which is good. Yes. So uh, the other question, uh, there are two questions. So maybe also you could take this, Dr. Njenga. What are the implementations of, you know, what's the plan to implement the recommendation? And uh, will we see partnerships with the other uh, NGOs and NGOs? So, who are working in this um, field. Okay. So um, I think this is what I had hoped uh, Dr. Njuguna would uh, speak to, um, uh, because there's, um, oh, there, there's a sense in which we no longer exist as a task force, because we uh, were created by government to do a very specific task, which which actually expired, our mandate expired the day, the Tuesday afternoon that we handed over the report um, to the government. Um, so if it sounds like I'm speaking a little bit out of turn, it's because I am. Um, that said, um, I think as Kenyans, um, which is a, an inalienable right, uh, we continue to have an interest uh, in what happens to government documents and documentations, such as the uh, task force report. Um, and I will say the following, that the process of implementation of the recommendation will be overseen by government itself. And uh, I suspect that the Office of the Director of Mental Health, headed by Dr. Njuguna, uh, will be the department in government um, that will be responsible for monitoring um, the, the implementation of this. That said, um, the report contains um, quite a number of recommendations um, whose implementation will be at many different levels. For example, there are fairly simple and straightforward recommendations that will find a um, solution by administrative actions um, by the minister. Um, and these, I think we um, are clear, um, and I have no doubt that the minister will be able to address them if uh, in his mind they are appropriate. The second set um, of, um, of recommendations are slightly more complex in nature um, and will require um, actions by the legislature. For example, um, issue to do with the decriminalization um, of, of suicide and attempted suicide. Um, very happily for us, uh, we engage a parliament and we know that parliament is ready and willing um, to rectify that, um, that anomaly. And then there's some other um, longer term uh, recommendations that would require uh, the intervention of government more broadly um, for example, our recommendations around uh, financing of uh, mental health in general, and in particular, what to do about a Mathari hospital and similar institutions, Portrees and, uh, and so on. 
This would require the involvement of uh, the treasury uh, that would need. So there, there are so many and, and such broad recommendations that uh, different departments, including the Ministry of, um, of Education, would have to, to be involved in the implementation. So it's not a one ministry involvement, it's a, it's a government involvement in the different uh, aspects um, of the report. I hope that answers the question. But always, always in, in our government, government structure, um, regional governments, I mean, uh, county governments, um, as well as actors in the, in the grassroots uh, must be involved. And indeed, this is one of the big lessons uh, that we took home, that really we cannot, um, as, as actors, pretend that we can ignore in implementation um, the community-based uh, structures. And there was a lot said, uh, by way of example, about the role of the first-line actors, not just clinical officers in health centers, but also community uh, volunteers. So all that is in the report, um, and I think um, this is music to my ear to hear that people are really interested and very keen on being part and parcel um, of, uh, of implementation. Priscilla? You're muted, you can't hear you again. Oh. Thank you, go on. Still muted, because I can... No, no, yeah, we can hear you goodly. Nice, nice, oh, nice. Very nice. Okay. Very good, yes. speak. So, um, another question is to the single parents. What about the single parents and the widows in our society? What about the military veterans and their families? Is this something that was considered in the report? Okay, Joyce? Military? Widows? Yes, all those things are considered in the report. Uh, the military. Some of the things that uh, were talked about and I think I mentioned is that long stay away from home is, uh, is uh, a special in, in, in itself. What should the managers do? And if you realize, I kept on saying that eh, we, there should be regular mental health debriefing on, uh, uh, on all sectors, including managers and staff. So here, the managers of the military need to be debriefed and understand what is mental health, what is good mental health. And if their officer is unwell, has a mental illness, what should be done? So, and what are the causes of mental illness in this uh, the group of people? So, if they can be allowed to have leave and stay at home briefly and come back like that, it helps. Other than being held up uh, somewhere for a very long time. The, the widows, the single mothers, all these, if you remember, I said, if, if, if we uh, stigmatize persons with mental illness, then it is us, the society, who are fueling mental illness in the society. So it is up to us, the society, to see how we can support. There is nothing that anyone can do to stop widowhood or, uh, the, or uh, to stop uh, single motherhood. But if it happens, how do we handle it? Do we always say that one or so and so? So it is as the society to be positive towards these people and support them. And at the end of the day, we shall have a good society with good mental health. So for the military, as I had also said, there's need to increase mental health services to these people. They require it. You can imagine you have gone and blown up, let's say, 100 people. Some may have been looking at you and saying, please, 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 but you bomb them up. What goes on in your mind? These people require a lot of debriefing because they act on uh, orders. They don't act on uh, saying, I will or I will not. It is orders. So at the end of the day, when you are left alone, 
what goes on in your mind. They require regular debriefing on mental health so that they can be able to relieve this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Priscilla, is there any, what you might call a burning question that will burn us if you don't answer it? Because it's now 10 past four. Burning question? Can't hear you. You're burning away the time. <laughs> There's a comment. Go on. Yeah, uh, that we seem to be working to looking at the both, uh, you're not be able differentiating between the active personnel and those who are veterans in our in the report or so that's the comment that like are we able to differentiate between the two and actually just give um actions on both it's a very interesting question because i don't think uh, i could be wrong that we spoke to veterans as such but um, we spoke to active members of the of the forces um, the fact that you're in the force now must mean that you will one day become a, a veteran. I do know, for example, that the, um, the uh, I think the armed forces in general, but definitely the army, have a very good um, medical scheme that is very generous, that, um, that looks after them. And I believe that is a first step in looking after the veterans. I think it behoves um, Priscilla and other people uh, in government, so, yes, uh, to look into this and find out if indeed we have special uh, programs and projects uh, that look after the veterans because like the elderly, really they are custodians of, our, um, of, of all the things that we are today. They've looked after us during their health times. Thank you, excellent comment. I will now ask very quickly for Raymond to make um, a quick closing comment. I will then ask Joyce to do the same. And then that will bring us to the end of our very, very interesting and exciting uh, Monday afternoon. Raymond? Uh, thank you so much, Chair, and dear participants for finding time and hearing this out. Uh, the same intention and the goodwill that uh, you have is the same goodwill that uh, as a task force member and uh, and uh, as um, an esteemed uh, person who was given the opportunity to be part of this conversation is also putting on government and i believe um, as you have rightly put it in terms of the actors who needs to help us into this implementation because as a country we are very good at doing good reports but we were very bold and we highlighted the whole challenge within this space that concerns to special population and all those areas that we have discussed. So Chair, um, I also wish to see some of the great gains and milestones that we proposed and I know they are going to come to fruition because the goodwill and the support and the ownership that has come out of this uh, report is immense. So thanks so much for even allowing us and to trust us uh, with this uh, uh, divine opportunity to serve. Thanks so much Chair. Thank you Joyce. Okay, thank you very much, Chair, and the participants, all those who are listening. We had to come up with this chapter because we know that it is the special groups have got special needs. We have not enumerated everything. You can go to the, to the book, to the report, and read. There is a lot on special groups. And uh, as I talked about children and mothers, it is very important that in particularly to the children, we pay a lot of special uh, attention because these are children who will be able to display signs and symptoms of mental illness, but that are not typically the signs of mental illness. So we really need to be vigilant to to see how we take care of the children. And for mothers, if a mother has a mental illness and has not been uh, uh, treated, we know that this will pass over to the family and in particular to the children who will not grow up well. So as a, as a society, we really need to give our mothers a good care not that whatever they ask for, we give them, but good care. 
needed care to take care of them so that they can take care of the children because we know that mothers are the ones who take care of children in their early childhood and so on before the fathers will provide school fees and so on. So very, very important that we take care of the children, we take care of the mothers, the mental health aspect. And as I, as I had concluded, I said, there is no health without mental health and there is no wealth without health. So please, let's take care of our mental health status, all of us, all of us, and in particular for the special groups so that our country is a healthy country. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I, I'm receiving many uh, private messages from Priscilla, from Nancy, um, telling us that this conversation is not finished. This conversation will continue on Twitter on Thursday. Perhaps you can hear between 12 and 1 p.m. Uh, mental health um, in special groups. So those for whom um, the questions have not uh, been adequately answered, uh, please engage the team uh, in the Twitch chat um, on Thursday between 12 and uh, 1 p.m. In the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to thank all the participants. Uh, this, you must agree, was a brilliant, brilliant panel. A special thanks to you, uh, Raymond and, um, and Joyce. Uh, special thanks to uh, Priscilla and, uh, and your team for the tireless efforts you have put uh, in putting this thing together. Uh, and finally, and perhaps most importantly to all of you uh, participants who continue to uh, give me reason uh, to continue working hard because it's clear to me that the, the, the people of Kenya are thirsty for, for knowledge in the field of mental health. And with this uh, level of support, um, I have no doubt that um, our country will achieve a great height in the resolution of some of the challenges that were identified uh, by the task force uh, in the time of its mandate. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and um, all being well. We will see you all on Monday at three o'clock uh, in discussion of the next chapter. Goodbye and a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, sure. and participants.